Greetings and welcome to the History of Babylon 5. Today's episode, The Earth Mimbari War. The Earth Mimbari War began in 2245 when an Earth Force expeditionary fleet destroyed and heavily damaged other supporting vessels in the Grey Council's fleet, killing the Mimbari leader Dukat. The human fleet commander misinterpreted the Mimbari warrior caste tradition of approaching a ship with the gum ports open as a hostile action and fired on the Mimbari vessel without provocation. The war lasted three years with the Earth outmatched by an enemy driven with a relentless genocidal zeal and ended with an unexpected Mimbari surrender at the Battle of the Line. Earth made the Mimbari fight for every square inch of space and the Mimbari inflicted many losses in the three years of the bloody conflict. The war was provoked by an Earth Alliance task force led by Captain Michael Jankowski aboard the warship EAS Prometheus, engaged on a mission to investigate the Mimbari. During the expedition, the Prometheus and her escorts encountered three Mimbari cruisers, one of which was carrying the Grey Council, the highest echelon of Mimbari society. The Grey Council was en route to investigate reports of sightings of their ancient enemy, the Shadows. Although Jankowski had been given strict orders not to do anything which might be perceived as hostile, Jankowski arrogantly disobeyed the orders and refused to jump to hyperspace when the Mumbari spotted his fleet. He thought that by waiting to the last possible moment to jump, he could gain valuable sensor information about the Mumbari cruisers, and this would lead to a promotion and medals from the grateful Earth Force Command. When he finally did decide to flee, it was too late. Upon seeing the Earth vessels, the Mimbari cruisers opened their gun ports as a sign of respect and strength, even though humans would have no knowledge of such a tradition. Dukat, leader of the Grey Council, realized the error and ordered the gun ports closed, but it was too late. Captain Jankowski misinterpreted the gesture as a sign of hostility, an impression compounded by the fact that the powerful sensors of the Mimbari cruisers accidentally disabled the Prometheus's jump engines thus preventing the ship from jumping to hyperspace and escaping. When told by his first officers that his vessel's jump engines had malfunctioned and the weapons on the Mimbari cruisers were hot, Jankowski panicked and opened fire on the Mimbari ships. After the Earth ships opened fire, they completely tore apart the Mimbari Charlin, ripping through the hull of the Charlin and killing their leader Dukat. This scene showed that Earth Force ships had enough firepower to easily destroy a Mimbari Charlin. But getting within range was very difficult, and the only real issue for Earth Force ships when fighting the Mimbari. After Dukat was killed, his protege Delenn cast the deciding vote on the Council in a fit of rage to wage a war of vengeance against Earth. However, the war of vengeance quickly turned into a holy crusade by the Mimbari to exterminate humanity. The Earth Alliance made frantic efforts to present official apologies to the Mimbari through all possible diplomatic channels and tried to obtain help from neutral aliens such as the Centauri. However, no alien race wanted to incur the wrath of the Mimbari military, and so Earth was left to fight alone. Immediately following the destruction of Jericho III, the Mimbari struck at least half a dozen Earth Force bases in the space of just a few days, leaving no survivors and accepting no surrender. Although Earth Force was losing in space combat, the war was far from over, and Earth had a clandestine plan to exterminate the Mimbari race, although it was never carried out. During battles, Mimbari would even target ships no longer capable of fighting and destroy them. All attempts to communicate, including an offer to turn over Michael Jankowski, were rebuffed. In contrast to human concepts of total war, the Mimbari fleet moved methodically through the outer colonies, eliminating defensive structures and moving on, leaving civilian structures mostly untouched. At the time, Earth Dome believed this behavior was linked to the Mimbari caste system, which targeted human warriors first. However, it was assumed that after destroying Earth, they would return to exterminate the now disorganized and defenseless civilians. Thus, by the end of the war, most of Earth's colonies and outposts were still intact, and Earth Force was able to recover quickly. Indeed, many believed that Earth was even strong enough to fight the Mimbari on equal terms. Earth Dome had thought of a new way to fight, and very likely even defeat the Mimbari. Earth's plan was to unleash bioweapons on the Mimbari, thus exterminating the Mimbari race. 
This plan would have worked, but Dr. Franklin, the only man with access to the Membari complete DNA sequence, burned all of his notes to prevent his work from being used to annihilate the entire race. Without access to this data, as well as refusal from other top medical scientists to participate, Earth could no longer use bioweapons to defeat the Membari. Fortunately, the Membari later surrendered. Although Earth Force ships did have the firepower to destroy Membari, Membari stealth technology foiled attempts to acquire a weapons lock, and thus human ships were forced to fly in dense formations to come into firing range for a manual lock. Attempts to acquire more advanced weaponry from their long-term trading partners, the Centauri Republic, were rebuffed, as the Centauri had no intention of siding against the Membari by aiding their enemy. The Narn regime, on the other hand, proved to be more than willing. The weapons that they sold were reverse-engineered Centauri weapons, which raised Narn's hopes that the Membari would turn on their enemies for siding with the humans, while considering the risk of the Membari instead attacking themselves acceptable. Engagements weren't restricted to outposts and colonies. In 2247, two dozen Earth warships were lost to hit-and-run attacks in the space of only three weeks. Though no personnel had survived an attack, word at the time was that there was some kind of ace cruiser on the prowl. That theory was proven correct when a small fleet led by the EAS Lexington was attacked in an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. The Lexington itself was crippled in the opening salvo as the Membari flagship, the Black Star, jumped into the middle of the fleet, killing its commander, Captain Roger Stearns, and left adrift while the Black Star engaged the remainder of the fleet. Thinking fast, John Sheridan had his crew seat several nearby asteroids with a trio of two megaton tactical nuclear warheads, then sent out a distress call to lure the Black Star back to their position. As the Membari cruiser moved into range for a clear shot, Sheridan remotely detonated the two nukes and obliterated the Black Star. Earth Dome wasted no time in capitalizing on what was to date the only victory in the entire war, broadcasting the footage throughout the Alliance. For their part, the Membari were less impressed. The warrior cast, in particular, were affronted at being defeated by such a dishonorable tactic. And Sheridan would become infamously reviled as Starkiller. By this point in the war, somewhere between 50 to 60,000 humans were killed. Over the next six months, 200,000 more would die. Even as more and more outposts and colonies fell, the humans made the Membari fight for every square inch of space. In the Battle of Sinzar, a crippled Earth dreadnought deliberately rammed a damaged Membari war cruiser that was attempting to escape, destroying both ships in the process. At Flynn Colony, ground-based weapons forced the Membaris to land. Warriors on the planet and incredible hand-to-hand -hand combat raged across the planet's surface. Though the Membari were always victorious, they more often than not came away from these battles battered and bruised. Indeed, though the humans could hardly appreciate or be aware of it at the time, Word of their repeated noble last stand spread to almost every Membari. In the early days of the war, the humans were perceived as cowards and savages, as evidenced by their unprovoked assault and the murder of Dukat. However, as this demonized image of humanity proved more and more to be false, many Membari, particularly in the worker and religious caste, began to doubt the justification of the war, though few could see a way to stop the madness that had engulfed them. The Battle of the Line The Membari, frustrated by the futile but persistent human resistance and their pride wounded by the handful of Earth Force victories, were determined to utterly annihilate the younger species by the time their fleet finally reached the human homeworld. Knowing that nothing less but total annihilation of Earth's populace and later all colonies will be going on, Earth Alliance started to evacuate people from Earth. To give Earth's civilian population time to flee to neutral territory, military and civilian leaders on Earth desperately organized a last stand to hold the line against the night. Nearly all of Earth Alliance's remaining warships, fighters, and personnel were combined into a vast armada of more than 20,000 vessels, most of which were fighters. They were placed in near-Earth orbit and waited for the Membari to strike. Though a noble gesture, the defense was to no avail. In the engagement that became known as the Battle of the Line, an enormous fleet of Membari war cruisers jumped from hyperspace and attacked the human armada with overwhelming firepower. They swiftly destroyed almost all of Earth Force defenders, with the desperate human pilots reduced to kamikaze tactics. 
But then, just on the cusp of a total Mimbari victory, came the most unexpected twist in the war. The Mimbari ceased fire and surrendered unconditionally to Earth. The entire galaxy reeled at the news of this impossible reversal, and a great deal of wild speculation was voiced about what could have caused this drastic capitulation. However, the Mimbari's governing Grey Council never revealed the official reason, even to their own people. The aftermath. With the war over, the Earth Alliance pledged to build a diplomatic space station in neutral territory to promote galactic peace and prevent such misunderstandings in the future, known as the Babylon Project. After the first three stations were sabotaged, while the fourth vanished without a trace, the final station was known as Babylon 5. Having barely survived the Mimbari assault, Earth Force began an incredible effort to rebuild and to acquire more and more advanced technology and weapons to avoid such a disaster again. Thank you for watching the history of Babylon 5. Special thanks to the Babylon Project Wiki for all information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you have, thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.